Hey, how's it going? I hope you're having a great day. You know, real estate has traditionally been a very good investment, hasn't it? It's probably been the most preferred lever for generating wealth in our lifetime, certainly over the last half century. But now, as we hone in on 2025, you uh, could say, that was then, what about now? Is it still a secure way to protect and grow your wealth, or has the long upward run in home and property values finally reached its pinnacle, its zenith? Are we now over the hump, so to speak, and heading back down to a more, more uh, sobering state of affairs? Is the current trajectory one that sees profit in real estate as something that's still possible, or is it a thing of the past? Stay tuned, we're about to find out. Hey, I'm excited to share with you today the good, the bad, and the ugly as it pertains to the history of real estate. We're going to look at where we were in the past, where we are currently, and where we might be expected to be going going forward. Now, to be fair, that's not an easy task because real estate, uh, the real estate market, is in many ways an entity that continu continually challenges our assumptions. Still, it is interesting to review and analyze what happened to bring property values to where they are today and to also speculate about where values may go in the years ahead. So that's the journey in this video, and I hope you find it compelling and interesting, at least as compelling and interesting as I do. I hope you stick around to the end. <laughs> but first, an anecdote, a, a, little, a personal story, if you will. It was the summer of my second year as a teenager. I had just turned 14 years old at the end of June, and I was trying to earn some extra money between grades 9 and 10, working a summer job for my uncle in construction. His specialty was finishing uh, concrete, finishing cement, and in that capacity, he had a contract with a high volume builder to pour and finish uh, the basement floors, the garage floors, the front porches, as well as the steps and the sidewalks around each uh, home at a massive residential development in London, Ontario. This new subdivision was bustling with tradespeople who were practically stepping over each other trying to get their work done. New foundations were being poured every week. Framers, roofers, bricklayers and siding installers were chomping at the bit not far behind. And the other subtrades, the plumbers, the electricians, the drywallers, painters, trim carpenters, etc. were all in a frenzy vying for position in homes on the job site because of course time is money. In the midst of this milieu, my job was fairly simple. I had to form and pour concrete sidewalks around a new house each day, that house always being immediately next door to the house that had been done previously the day before. My cousin and I would level the dirt, we would put down a base of sand and gravel and then frame and stake the sidewalks in the late morning and early afternoon. This was always after, of course, having first stripped the forms from the previous day's job earlier in the morning. We would then pour concrete into these forms mid to late afternoon and work like crazy to finish the concrete before the sun baked it into an un unworkable solid mass. It was hard work, but it was also mindless in a way which gave me some time to think. And I remember thinking on at least one occasion, wow, this building frenzy seems unsustainable. I wonder when it will end. Well, you know, that was several decades ago, and what I have learned in the intervening time is that in some ways it never did end. Sure, there were slowdowns at times, especially during periods of economic uncertainty, but in retrospect, it seems to me now that this was just part of the regular rhythm. Canada was and is a growing country, and the need for more housing has continued virtually unabated through the years. That said, there have been some major events and impacts over the years that are cautionary reminders for us that nothing is ever quite as certain as it appears. Consider uh, the history of the 1970s and the 1980s as an example, and we're going to compare that to more recent times. 
Through much of the 1970s, there was a, a building and a buying frenzy for new homes. It actually started prob probably in the latter half of the 1960s, I would say, but it really built steam and kind of hit its stride in 70, 71, and 72. By 1972, the market was absolutely stir-crazy. It was as if people had lost their marbles. Many people wondered why they hadn't bought homes earlier, and now suddenly they couldn't get on the bandwagon fast enough. House prices were rising exponentially, and again, people were thinking that they had to buy right now or risk getting left behind. Some builders who had signed agreements of purchase and sale with buyers prior to the commencement of construction of these homes exercised clauses which were conveniently included in their builder contracts, allowing them to renegotiate the price closer to construction completion based on various circumstances. If the buyers put up too much resistance, then the builder could simply terminate the agreement and sell the home to someone else. <laughs> it was a heady time, and yet for those who had eyes to see and ears to hear, there were dark clouds forming on the horizon. First, there was a, a decoupling of the U.S. dollar from the gold standard in 1971. Now, many people saw this as a good thing, and of course, there were benefits. But it also created a currency which was no longer grounded to anything tangible. And as we've seen over time, that lack of grounding led to an ongoing, ever-increasing devaluation of the dollar. Then there was the oil crisis in 1973, just two years later, which precipitated a tripling can you imagine that? A tripling of the cost of gas, diesel fuel, and heating fuel. And this, of course, had a trickle-down effect on everything else. Food and clothing costs, prices for cars and pickup trucks, and house prices all went up dramatically. Workforce wages scrambled to keep up for a time, and they might have kept pace too, except that central banks were now raising interest rates at an ever faster pace in their attempt to tame inflation. In Canada, and I would say particularly in Ontario, the economy seemed to be firing on all cylinders for most of the 1970s. Houses and subdivisions continued to be built at a brisk pace, and companies everywhere were frantically hiring workers in their attempt to keep up with what seemed to be an almost inexhaustible demand for goods and services. As mentioned, it was a heady time. But in retrospect, we can see that the surge in demand was really I would say too much, too fast. And the money to pay for it was losing value as quickly as it was being printed. I bring this all to your attention because there are parallels, I would say, to our own more recent experiences. Think about this. Since 2000, the real estate market in Ontario has been slowly building into a kind of a pressure cooker, brought on by a combination of population growth, uh, government housing policies, and a strong economy. The pressure cooker was actually generally viewed through most of the 2000s as a net positive. That is until 2008 when suddenly the global financial crisis stopped economic growth in its tracks. I myself uh, remember vividly being the primary salesperson for a large new luxury housing development at that time. It was a beautiful, stunning, I would say, master plan community around a highly renowned golf course. And to say that myself and those, uh, my associates who were involved in this pro project were excited about it is an understatement. We had enthusiastically high hopes in August of 08 when we unveiled new floor plans and exterior elevations and limited time exclusive pricing at a lavish grand opening of three brand new model homes and a sales center. A grand opening that uh, splurged on fine food, on entertainment, fireworks, and uh, more. Thousands of, uh, not thousands, a thousand invited guests came through our model home that weekend and everyone raved about how beautiful uh, those model homes were and how this was going to be an amazing community and a smashing success. But you know, that was only three to four weeks bef uh, before the financial crisis that was brought on by the fall of Lehman Brothers on September 15th, 2008. And there was already kind of an incipient nervousness in the air. 
and so, you know, there were a thousand people that came through our model homes that weekend, and yet we secured only one deposit for a, a reservation for a, on a lot. A reservation that actually caved a few weeks later. So in other words, a big fat donut for all of the glitz and the glamour at this grand opening, for all of the, uh, of the hype and the promise of a beautiful master plan golf course community. And then over the next year and a half, we had only seven sales of new homes in that development. Seven sales that were arduously, painstakingly eked out, each one seemingly more difficult than the last. And $50 million, give or take, had already been spent on the golf course and on its facilities, on the sewage treatment plant, on the pumping station, and uh, on the first phase of streets and roads, roadways, etc. $50 million and only seven sales in a year and a half. To say that that was a challenging time is an understatement. For me personally, it was, it was uh, the most difficult time of my career. I sometimes think that if we've learned anything, maybe uh, it's that we haven't learned anything at all over these years, or maybe we've learned only to forget again. One of the, the problems that I see continually with the housing market is that it's difficult for buyers and sellers at any given moment to see beyond their immediate circumstance. And I say this not as a criticism, it's just kind of the way things are. We all tend to focus or see situations that are right in front of us, and we have a hard time seeing beyond that. So in the 1970s, for example, people that were on the real estate bandwagon could only see promise, they only saw opportunity. Then in the 1980s, when the market turned south, they only saw massive problems, interest rates that uh, were soaring and prices that were stagnant. And then in the 1990s, they began once again to have a semblance of hope and they saw a glimmer of returning promise. And that returning promise in the 2000s blossomed and flourished for pretty much 25 years, a quarter of a century, give or take, except for again, the financial crisis in 08, 09. Now we're in the mid 2020s and though we've had a significant shock again to the system with COVID-19, it still remains to be seen how this decade will be viewed historically. But putting that aside for a moment, what can we learn from a review of history that can help inform our real estate decisions and investments going forward? I think this question for most of us is the really important one. It's where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Is there a takeaway from all of the ups and downs and all the variations in the real estate market over the last few decades that can give us some certainty about what we should do now? You know, one of the common threads that we can see for sure when looking back is that houses have become less and less affordable for the average family over time. Most of us have generally interpreted this trend as the reason why buying a house is a good investment, and I would certainly agree with that interpretation. And of course, I'm sure that I'm not alone. You know, I read an article not long ago suggesting that the, that the Bank of Canada also agrees with this premise, so much so that they look at real estate, and I would say particular, particularly residential real estate, as a primary lever that will positively impact our national GDP into the latter half of this decade. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? The Bank of Canada sees growth in the real estate sector as one of the saving graces that will keep our economy from slipping into recession over the next four or five years. Now couple that with the history that we talked about. When you think about the oil crisis way back in 1973, it's easy to imagine that this was an unusual anomaly. But was it really? Was it any more of an anomaly than the Great Depression or the Second World War, the Vietnam War, or the financial crisis, or the COVID-19 pandemic? I think it is safe to say that the answer is no. The oil crisis was not any more of an anomaly than any of these other events. 
I mentioned earlier that what happened concurrently with the shocks to the system over the last few decades was that the average price for houses in Ontario went up dramatically. If you analyze the data, it went up from approximately twice the average household income in 1965 to three times the average household income just five years later in 1970. And if you extrapolate out till today, 7.4 times the average household income today. That is an amazing and important increase to keep in mind, especially when you consider that it's not even really taking into account the balance of inflationary pressures on household finances. In 1965, for example, a household income was really just the income of one person, that one person typically being the husband while the wife stayed at home with the children. Today, a household income is usually comprised of at least two incomes, both the husband and the wife working full time, for example. And increasingly, now we're also seeing intergenerational households with three or more people sharing the financial load. So that is a trend that needs to be factored into the affordability of homes as well. You know, some people think that this lack of affordability is going to lead to a massive correction in the market, in the housing market sometime soon. They assume that because housing has become less and less affordable for many people, at some point, the market is going to stall and this is going to cause prices to come back down. Now, I don't want to ever say never, but I really do not think that is going to happen. Or if it does happen, it will only be a temporary blip in the broader trajectory. It's not going to be indicative of a long-term trend. And I say this for the following reasons. First, as we all know, we have a housing shortage, a shortage that did not just happen overnight. In fact, it's been building bit by bit, year over year, ever since at least the year 2000, probably earlier. And while governments at all levels may be saying that they are going to rectify the problem by incentivizing the construction of more new homes, that is not going to happen overnight. In fact, I think it's going to take as long as it took for us to get into this situation, 20 to 25 years or more, for us to get back out of it. And if you believe the basic economic premise of supply and demand, I think it stands to reason that the tight supply of a product that remains in high demand means that the prices at the very least won't come down. Second, our population is continuing to grow. Again, that's not something that's going to change overnight, but it will add increased pressure to a housing supply that is already inadequate. And third, inflation is going to continue to negatively impact the value of the dollar. Now, I know that the Bank of Canada will do what's necessary to keep inflation in check at their target of about 2%, and that's great. But 2% per year still adds up to 20% over 10 years. And if, you have, if we have another circumstance like that which happened recently, then it stands to reason that 20% over 10 years could easily turn into 30% or more. What that means for us is that those who have cash holdings will continue to look for ways to protect these holdings by investing in assets that have enduring value. Look back over history, even going back to ancient times, it's easy to see that real estate has always been the single most important hedge for protecting wealth. And if the wealthy continue to invest in real estate, once again, that only puts more pressure on the affordability or lack thereof for housing on the rest of us. Anyway, I could go on and on. <laughs> there are nuances to each of these reasons that could probably add up to another series of reasons, as well as, I suppose, some compelling arguments against that which I'm suggest suggesting. And to be fair, each circumstance is as individual as the person living in that circumstance. So you can't just accept what I'm saying here as blanket advice, authoritative for everyone. It might be that you in your situation, that the best thing you could possibly do is go against the prevailing trend or against what I'm saying here. It might be that you need to liquidate, for example, when in another situation, it would be far better for you to hold onto your property. Whatever your circumstance, know that it is worthwhile to seek professional advice from somebody who you trust. And with that in mind, 
I would invite you to reach out to me personally or to someone on my team. I'll include links for various modes of communication in the, in the description below. And please know that my personal objective as well as that of my team is to provide the very best um, service possible. And that service really starts with listening, carefully conversing and dialogue, making sure we understand the situation in all of its nuances, and then offering advice that will hopefully help you make the very best decision for you and your loved ones. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching and for paying attention to the very end. If you did that, that is fantastic. Thank you so much. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Take care.